welcome to another episode of Marketing and Mocktails with Manal. Tonight's cup says hashtag, hashtag, because why not? And we live in a digital media world, so obviously hashtag awesome. I wanted to start tonight's episode by giving a very, very big thank you to Corey from Call Force. You know, it's not easy doing these episodes every week. It's not easy converting them into a podcast, creating marketing materials for them putting it out on YouTube, doing an email campaign. And the wonderful, wonderful call force is of a resource for us for tonight's episode. And not only is it a resource, but it's a product that I really believe in. And it's a product that has created, I think, tens of thousands of dollars worth of revenue. When you look at their numbers um, in different dental practices, because they really care, take care of so much going on. So if you want to take a try, if you want a company that can do it all, you know, um, go ahead and check out Call Force. Here is your special link. It's getcallforce.com slash Manal Sandhead. And you get special deals on there. Again, I don't get anything from it, but you guys get stuff from it. And once again, thank you, Call Force, for being super awesome and helping me do marketing and mocktails. Thank you so much. And then now we get to tonight's guest. So I met this person, I think, a couple of years ago, three years ago, I believe. And we were put together because we were presenting at a same conference. We were presenting together at a same conference. It was like a 30 tips in 30 minutes kind of a thing. Um, and she introduced herself to me as the new patient whisperer. And I still remember that because I'm like, how awesome is that? The new patient whisperer, you know? Um, and I immediately loved her. She has great ideas. She has great marketing tips. She's been doing this for a long time. And she has a wonderful last name. So here we have with us today, Genevieve Popey. Hello, Genevieve. Hello. <laughs> how are you today? I am so happy to be here with you tonight. And um, I'll always fondly remember our thrown together um, 30 minute, 30 tips marketing thing at DDMC. It was very fun and a great way to meet you. And I'm, I'm happy that we have lots of occasion to know each other and bump into each other in the industry since then. Absolutely. I mean, so many conferences we have been together at, we have presented together as well. Um, you know, so it, it's, it's a wonderful feeling to have people in your tribe Yes. That are that you feel comfortable with. Oh, and she knows my family. Yes. Yep. <laughs> I've I've oh. been to your family's jewelry store. I've purchased jewelry from your brother. <laughs> I have a, a picture of me and your parents. <laughs> I you know, it's so funny because I have all these people going to St. Thomas. Every time somebody goes to St. Yeah. Thomas, I'm like, go hang out with my family. Yes. It's just something yes. you have to do. So by now, so many of the connections I have I have already hung out in St. Thomas with my parents. No, but this is a sad part, Genevieve. They come back and they love them more. They're they like- They are really you know. nice. They're, re <laughs> <laughs> They're so, when all your parents and your brother are so nice that you know that some of the jewelry vendors there are aggressive, right? Mm. And trying to get you into their store. And when I say that I'm going to Gold Star, they're like, oh yeah, no, they're nice. <laughs> So, yeah, they're they're nice. They don't even try to fight. They won't with even me. block you. Like yeah. they won't even try to sell no, you. So already no, going to them. No fighting. <laughs> just, just go because they're like we can't we can't even compete. We can't argue guys. with that, right? And it's so funny. So many people have gone to St. Thomas, and you were there. You know, let's get into our conversation. Oh, before we do that, yes, yeah. I see we have viewers coming in. Yeah, Susan exactly. and Trish, can you see them too, Genevieve? I can see them. It's really small for me, but yes, awesome, perfect. If you're watching. Please tell us who you are. Tell us hello. Tell us where you're watching from. Jennifer, Trish, Susan, thank you so much. Oh, I see that we have a viewers coming in. We have some comments coming in. Thank you guys for joining us oh, live tonight. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Oh, Susan's on. Hi, everybody. Hi, and please send your questions. We're going to be doing a lot of marketing tips today. And please, like I said, let us know where you're watching from so you can get a hello right here and right now. Shout right. <laughs> so going back to St. Thomas, right? Yes. Um, you were there, so you you understand this um, dilemma, this market that we have. Yes. And it's one street. Yes. And all jewelry stores. Yes. Right? Yeah. And it's so hard for people to realize that because when I'm speaking, I tell people to close their eyes and imagine that all these people, like if you are in one street and you're all dentists, 
Yeah. And you're sharing your wall with your competition, like your left side, your right side, your, your competition in front of you, your competition behind you. You're surrounded by competition, but yet you still can make money. Yes. And isn't that kind of like similar to our dental industry? I mean, we have so much competition. There is dental practices popping up every blog. There is free everything, apparently. We can get yeah. free whatever we want. Yep. <laughs> There are deals galore. Yeah. Yes. There's always a special. Yeah. There's always a promotion. There's always a special. There is, um, you know, always, a, even if you make them wait, they're going to see us. That's okay. Even if I cancel a few appointments, they're going to see me. That's okay. Yeah. Um, in a way, you know, and with new patients and with everything that you have done, what I come down to a lot of times is it doesn't matter how much marketing you have you have or how much money you spend on marketing no. unless you have a conversion amen <laughs> that's equal to zeros that's the negative of yeah. uh, of marketing you know you could have a beautiful billboard you could have a beautiful website you could have great reviews yeah. um, you could be paying me tons of money to help you come up with your marketing strategy and all that wonderful stuff mm -hmm. but if that phone rings yes and there that is one, no you should answer it right call for a story <laughs> <laughs> exactly. If you will need that, you need call force because this is yeah. what conversions are. Not answering your phone. First step number one is answer your phone when it rings. It's mind boggling to me the number of people that invest heavily in marketing and then look at hiring another person to answer the phone as an expense they just can't bear. And it doesn't make any sense to me at all. No other company, no other industry on the planet would spend as much money in marketing as dentists do and then not have a highly trained, highly available sales team answering those leads. Well, you know, and that's the important part because it's not even, so first of all, you need somebody who's going to answer their phone. Yes. Right away, because I am not waiting for you. No. Or I'm a, they're I'm not, not calling you back. I'm they're not, not leaving a message, they're not calling you back. It's not happening. And the other thing is how that conversion happens. Because you know, I shared in my group last week my horrible phone conversation with a potential new dental practice <laughs> that I, me, that me, I was was you know planning yeah. on going to. And again, they have a great website, they have a great reviews. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I look at I look at their reputation, they have good reputation, and then I called and you saw my entire I, I regret it and died a little, yes. I mean, I had to be like, do you need my name? Right. <laughs> <laughs> How many times do you have to say, do you need my name? Hi, yes, I see you're making my appointment. Do you need my name? Did you want to put a name on that appointment? Or? And, then, and then, then I had to tell her what kind of appointment. Like, she couldn't even tell me. She's like, yeah, so what kind of appointment do you want? Right. After she apparently scheduled me in the schedule. And I'm like, so what are you even putting me? I'm like, Who am I even seeing? Who right? am I even seeing? And she kept, it, it was one of the worst phone conversations I've ever had. Yes. And um, at that point, I was so frustrated. And I'm like, no wonder. I bet, I bet this dentist is going, I have all this marketing spending going out. And I looked at their website and stuff, and I know the company they spend money with. I know how yeah. much they charge. And he's probably like, I have all these things going on. Why are our new patient numbers so low? I promise you they're calling their marketing company saying, this isn't working. We need more new patients. You're sending us the wrong kind of patients. Um, these Google patients aren't good patients. You know, I, I hear this stuff all the time and I've probably listened to more recorded phone calls than almost anybody I know. Mm. <laughs> and um, sometime, actually, you know, sometime we should reenact my worst phone calls of the week. That would be really fun. I would love to do would that. Would that be awesome? Like, I would love to do that. So here's the thing about the people who have these bad phone calls. And I want to be super clear about this. They're not bad people. They're not like mean people. They're not intentionally being rude. They've just literally never been taught how to do the very simple thing of answering a lead, an inquiry, you know? So like sometimes when I call or start working with offices, I'll say things like, how do you guys think you do with new patient conversion? And the team will always say to me, pretty, we schedule pretty much everybody. And what's funny is they don't even recognize opportunities as opportunities. So what they mean is they schedule pretty much everybody who calls and says, I want to schedule a new patient appointment. But when they think of a phone call that says, do you take Delta Dental? They think of that as, oh, he just wanted to know if we take Delta Dental. 
if they don't even think of it as a potential new patient call, you know, nor have they ever been taught to. So well, listen, this lady didn't even ask me if I have insurance. Yeah. Or didn't even, <laughs> didn't even ask me. She sounds like somebody who maybe yeah. shouldn't be answering the phone. Like didn't even want my phone number. I mean, are you going to confirm this call or confirm, yeah. like, with me? Uh, it was the worst. And, you know, this brings me to our important point tonight. What are, given all the phone calls you have received, it, mm -hmm. you know, focusing so much on conversions, what are some of the crucial factors for that new patient conversion call? There's a couple of really crucial factors to converting a new patient phone call. So the average patient phone call is basically viewed as an opportunity to answer questions and collect information. That's what I hear happening all the time. But if you apply any sort of um, sales or connection strategy to those phone calls, basically what you have to do is build trust, connect what you have to offer to that person, and then ask for the appointment. Those are like the three main things to do. And when I first kind of say that, people are always like, well, yeah, that sounds nice, but that's not how our calls go. And so really one of the primary things that I really try to teach people is to react to that first question differently. You know, if you read any any blog all over Facebook, what you what you see is negative articles about price shoppers and negative articles about insurance driven patients. And I'm going to tell you that patients who call and ask about price and patients who call and ask about insurance participation are not bad patients. They're not stupid people. They're not people who don't care about your value. You know, we attach all of these beliefs to it, right? And it's crazy town. They're just people calling to say, hey, can I come there? Can I afford this? And I, I think if you attach all sorts of negative assumption to that starting point, you'll never convert them. But if you can, if you can be a person who can say, oh, let's take a look at that. Tell me about this implant you need. Your reaction, your ability to learn a little bit more about that person, to understand something that matters to them beyond price, and then build some trust and connect back what you have to offer to what they need. Um, that is, it, it's, is that hard and it's that simple. You know, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. It's, it's breaking that reaction, but psychologically people are not looking for an informational exchange and to be educated right and that's what we're so wired to do you know this as a hygienist yeah, right? right we're taught to educate people and give more information and give big explanations and i think some people think it comes down to having the exact perfect verbiage and i can tell you what it comes down to is having the exact perfect mindset <laughs> it's so true can you i mean it's like when you have a memorized mm -hmm. verbiage it comes out as memorized yes. verbiage exactly what it is without any thought process and what makes humans humans and not yes. robots or chatbots yes which we use so much in our marketing today is the mindset and is the ability to react yes. accordingly to the conversation yes. and as soon as that is dropped you lose that connection yeah and if you have no connection, you have zero ability to overcome what could be seen as an objection or a barrier, right? So it's to me, teaching teams to be intentional about building connection first. And, you know, I do that in a couple simple ways. Like I'm happy to shout it from the mountaintops. Um, you don't even have to pay me to learn this tonight. <laughs> right, so, let's, so let's do this. Let's go into the, let's go into the major question that we usually have, right? Yes. When you get that phone call and they say, do you accept my insurance? What do you say? I say, I'd be happy to check on that for you. What's your name? What? <laughs> That's it? That's it. <laughs> you mean I, you didn't just say, okay, no, I I'm sorry, and just hang out up? Out-of-network provider with that insurance, but we're happy to file your paperwork as a courtesy. The, uh, that doesn't work. I, I'm sorry. I know that's what so many people are out there attached to and trained in it. It does while well, the patient hears is no. So I pretend like I'm checking my magic insurance computer and like I'm proceeding with helping them. And I just say, let me take a look for you. What's your name? And then I gather their name, a phone number to call them back. And I just very quickly get to now before I check on your plan here, tell me what we need to get you in here for. Right. And I just get them talking to me. So it's very simple for me. It's it's answering their question with a helpful, I call it putting a pin in the question, right? Just like a helpful, oh sure, let's take a look. And I recognize you can hear my Wisconsin when I say this, oh sures. 
but say it your way <laughs> or channel your inner Wisconsin girl because it really works for me and say, you know, oh, sure. Let's take a look at that. I do the same thing if somebody says, how much is an implant? You know, I don't say we don't quote fees over the phone, which is a harsh, a hard wall. And it lets people feel like it's too much money for you to even tell me. I just say, you know, let's take a look at that. Tell me about this implant you need. People who need an implant and people who need the biggest case dentistry, they often start with price questions. And if you're rattled by those, or even worse, what I see is like offended by them. Like I, I see a very negative reaction in our industry about price questions. And I'm just not afraid of them at all. <laughs> I love a price shopper. A price shopper is somebody getting ready to do some dentistry. I think that so much, like you said, it depends on the mindset. But what you just did mm -hmm. was so simple. Yes. And was so basic. Yes. That you just let go of all this. We've worked with all insurances and we can talk about this and blah, 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 blah. And you just made it super simple. Mm -hmm. And you just made it into a conversation. Yes. And, you know, Rhonda here just commented and says, she says, I love that. It's that hard. And it's that simple. Mm hmm. It, is, it seems so simple. It's why I can tell people this all the time. And it's why I still have to coach them on it because it's like, it's really, we love to give the right answer. You know what I mean? Like when we know the answer, we want to give it and we want, we like almost can't help ourselves. But to answer that question, it's, it's really just about shifting gears, not being so reactionary to that first question, learning a little bit more about them. And then when it comes time to answer their question, you know, I just move into what I call problem solving mode. I just, I, I don't skirt it. I don't give them some clever, like misleading information or adapt the approach that if they just come here, then they'll like us and then they won't be mad. You know, I, I think that makes people really mad and then they leave you a negative review, you know? So if they are a person who's really stuck on that in network participation, don't tell them something clever, like we take all insurances, you know, that that doesn't really serve you. But what I find is that most people who are asking about insurance are really asking you two things. And they're asking you, can I come there? And can I afford it? And that's a, and that isn't that a simple question? And isn't that fair? You and know, isn't what that I mean? fair? Absolutely. Fair to ask. I mean, as a marketing person, there are so many tips and tricks that I can tell you. Right. Um, but it's borderline, that would be borderline lying. Right. And I don't believe in that. Like I have had practices, Genevieve, that I worked with where they come to me after working with other people. And what happens is it's a quantity game and not a quality game. Yes. So out of a sudden they see this increase in their new patient numbers, right? And they're like, Manal, we are this, you know, we were such a great, we we're doing so well. We had all these new patients coming in, fantastic. And then I'm like, well, if you have all these new patients coming in, why do you need me? Yes. Right? <laughs> like, why are you calling me right now if your new patient numbers are increasing all the time? I'm a marketing strategist. Why do you need me? Right. And then as soon as I have them go back and start looking, first of all, they don't know how many of those new patients are rescheduling back to come back to six months appointment yes. or becoming lifelong patients. Yes. Or if they're simply all right, well, we're going to give you a comp this time or sorry, we don't accept your insurance or well, now we have all these negative reviews coming in yep. or why can't, you know, and trust is an important thing. You um, can't, and you can't fix that reputational damage of, of reviews that say you, they people were lied to. Those are really, I mean, sometimes we get a bad review. Sometimes people don't like the dentist, but when you have, when you start to gather a lot of reviews and I've seen it, I've been called into offices um, that have had some other types of trainings that were basically have a two minute phone call, just get people in. And they do, they see this spike in new patients and they also watch their reputation tank and they don't retain any of them and they spent a fortune doing it and it corrupts their culture. It hurts their practice in a lot of ways. And I know, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to repair, really hard to repair. Yeah, and I you know, know. Um, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I just say, and the, the part about they're not even understanding the retention, I see that same thing all the time. And even though I'm the new patient whisperer, if your new patients aren't actually creating growth in your practice, if your practice isn't actually getting bigger as a result of all the new patients you're seeing, something's not working, right? 
and so I meet, I meet practices in my side all the time and all where they're like, yeah, we're seeing 40 new patients a month. And I'm like, fantastic. How many hygiene days have you added? And they say, none, we can't have, we can't even keep next week filled. <laughs> you know, I'm like, that math doesn't add up, does it? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I would love to help you with your new patients, but I think we need to take a look at our retention. Absolutely. And it's yeah. become, um, it's, I have seen it so much now that for me, I have changed into saying that your, I, your brand is not your logo. It's not your colors, not your brand is your reputation. You could have the most beautiful office in the world. You could have the yeah. most amazing looking yeah. scrubs and the most beautiful, again, a radio ad and a TV ad, and you could be giving them out, you know, VIP tickets to games and everything else. Yep. But if your reputation sucks, none of that matters. Correct. That your brand is your reputation. Yes. That's the most important part of it. And then going back to marketing, what is the goal of marketing? To make more money, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when you have 40 new patients coming in and mm -hmm. 20 are leaving, right. you're still at 20. Yeah. Right? You are not, you have to be able to increase that number in value and not just quantity. Yes. And that all happens with retention. I was talking to somebody else recently where I had a practice call me, one location practice, Genevieve, over 150 new patients a month. Mm -hmm. Okay. Again, my conversation was, well, why do you need me? Right. And I'm honest. I'm a very honest person. And then we had, then I had yes. them go back their reportings and do their numbers. And we realized it's a retention issue. And I said, okay, before we spend any money in our marketing, we have to figure out why these people are leaving. Yes. Why can't you keep them? Why are they not scheduling again? Are you giving away treatment? Are you doing a promotion that's pretty cheap and is attracting the people who are shoppers like, and not necessarily looking for a dental home? Yeah. All these questions are important to bring that value. I rather have you be seeing 40 patients, and I have a practice like this. Mm -hmm. I rather have you be seeing 40 patients and increasing your production every year than worrying about that 40 new patients number. Yes. Because it's all yeah. about making money. The number of new patients is really not the relevant metric. You but know, it is just so many people, right? Like that's it, what they that's what they do. That's how they what's scary is that's how they judge their growth. And that isn't the only fact, it's only one piece of the growth equation. You know, right. it's, and some practices really need fresh blood or they're a specialty that require new patients. Um, or they were acquired practice where the patient base is very aged and they need a, a new refresh. Right. But I sometimes see things as really honestly as, base, as basic as the fact that they just gave up on doing recare. They're like, oh, we have an automated service. We just, that, it does that. And I'm like, okay, it does that and it works for the people who respond to it. But then for all the people who didn't, you just haven't even done any, you haven't attempted, you haven't even picked up the phone and attempted one call, you know, I, that's mind boggling to me <laughs> that you'd rather yeah. buy more patients than activate your existing patients. Absolutely. And here, are, you know, we are going over some tips here on how to identify a patient retention issue. And, mm -hmm. you know, some of these things that we are talking about right now are our numbers game. They are a numbers game where you are looking at, okay, production. And like you said, if you're seeing all these patients, how many hygiene days have you added on? Yeah. That's again, a very simple gut check on it, you know, and I know you and I probably both have ways that we look at, I call it, you know, growth versus churn. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of dental practices don't even understand the concept of churn or customer churn. But I uh, very often when I examine new patients and the way they contributed to growth in a practice, I, I sometimes help practices discover that they've been on a downward trend in terms of total number of active patients for the last, you know, 12 to 18 months, like they haven't even felt it because they just keep filling in holes with new patients, but their practice hasn't gotten any bigger, you know, production's flat. Um, we haven't added any more provider time and it's just, they're just relying on new patients to fill in an operating or systemic inefficiency, or sometimes it's a harder look and it's a, it's a patient experience issue. You know, it's a, it's a real disconnect from how people are feeling when they're in the office. It's, and I think it's how they're feeling when they're in the office, but it's also a lack of communication, relevant communication. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 
there could be, um, and you know, we talk, we can talk about value forever. And that's, yes. okay. I almost, I almost feel like value is an overused word. Now value is so overused that it's no longer valued. Right. Uh, <laughs> we, need a hot new, we need a new we need hashtag. A, we need a hot new trendy <laughs> hashtag now because I feel like everybody we talk to add value to it. Yes. Add value to it. But it's like, well, how the hell do I add value to it? Right. You know, what do you want me to say? I'm telling these people how important it is. I'm telling them how, uh, you know, how much need it is for them to really have a proper care system. Like this is a comprehensive care. We are not just talking about oral care anymore. It's comprehensive care. You can, yes. you can show them x-rays. You can tell them that it's a Saturday appointment. It's just for you, you know? Yes. And, and it's so it's so interesting that everybody keeps saying that put value, put value, put value. And I totally understand that you need to have value. But I think what I mean by that there is a communication lag is that your communication has to match your audience. Yes. So if you have a patient that does care about their beautiful smile and they are somebody who is into whitening and they love cosmetic work and they are there every, yes, talk to them about how valuable it is for them to have continue to have that beautiful smile, to continue to have them to come. If you have a patient that really doesn't care and comes in with you know stains all over their teeth and is like, yes. listen, I brushed twice yesterday. That was a victory for me. Right. Your conversation with them about let's make you come in all the time, um, even though it's important, but you need to understand what they're going to value. Your value needs to match their value. You have to speak that language so that there is a common ground you're and there right. is an understanding. Exactly right. And I watch this just like I'm talking about on the phone where people try to give stock answers and they want to educate people with the perfect answer about insurance. I watch clinicians do this all the time, all, all the time. You know, I, I think a lot of hygienists are guilty of giving the same lecture to every single patient, even though you've been seeing Bill for 20 years and you know he's never going to floss, you know, and I, I learned a lesson many, 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 many years ago when I was a young office manager. We had this family of, of patients that had seen us for a long time, and then they kind of fell off. And it was a small enough practice that I noticed this, and I ran into sort of the female head of household at Boston store at the time. And I saw her and I was like, Teresa, I haven't seen you in forever. You know, why don't, why don't you guys come in anymore? You know, have you moved? What's going on? And she's like, honestly, I don't even know how to tell you this. And I'm like, well, I just want you to tell me. And she said, I really got tired of ex hygienists lecture. Wow. And it she, was said, yeah. she said, I don't come to the dentist to feel like a bad person. And I don't come to the dentist to feel guilty. And like, I'm shabby. I try to take care of myself and it feels like it's never good enough. And this was a really eye-opening moment for me because I can tell you for sure this hygienist would not would die if she knew she made that person feel that way. That would not that would not be her intention. She wholeheartedly believes that she's educating this person, that she's helping them by educating them. And instead, I mean, it, it lost us Teresa and her four kids and her husband and her brother who came there and her dad who came there. And I, I was so I'm still to this day grateful for that moment in Boston store where I saw her because it it really changed my perspective. At the time, I worked for a high end restorative doctor who literally taught me that if people didn't accept treatment, it was because I hadn't educated them enough. And what I've come to learn is that people accept treatment when you can tie how that treatment benefits them mm -hmm. in a way that reflects something that they care about. And for some people, that isn't about having perfect periodontal health. For some people, that isn't about having a movie star smile. It's so they can eat corn on the cob again. You know, and some people stay with you because you have the same breed of dog as the doctor. You know, I mean, it's different for every person. And it doesn't mean that because one person doesn't value what we value, that they're not a good patient for us. You know, I think we just, we're kind of, sorry, I'm on my soapbox, but I think we get kind of on our high horse about that when it comes to patients and it costs us a lot in retention. No, it absolutely does. And I am glad that you shared that story with us because it's so true. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a hygienist and 
I remember the hygiene school days where we were taught educate, 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 oral hygiene education, every single appointment. Even if you don't have time, you need to make sure that you're teaching them how to floss correctly using, you know, putting your floss in the middle fingers and then, you know, making sure that you're, you need to make sure that you're teaching, teaching, teaching. And it's absolutely true. You know, the number one rule in marketing is know your audience. Yes. <laughs> and as it's, as again, very simple. Mm -hmm. And the foundation of conversion is to know your audience. Yeah. So I had a um, one of my clients recently actually called me up and she said she got a huge implant case because she was talking to this woman and in the conversation she found out that uh, this she, the woman, the patient is a grandmother and has a wedding coming up. Yes. Um, and it's a granddaughter's wedding and that was the whole reason of the phone call and now the women started connecting oh I have a granddaughter too oh how exciting it's a wedding and oh this is why you want to do this and blah 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 and she signed up not worrying about again she probably didn't even ask her exactly where the t implants have to go and how many teeth she was missing and this is what I you know ex I don't think we can know our audience if we don't listen to them ever and so so many dental conversations that I hear are us talking it's us talking, it's us explaining. There's very few open-ended questions happening in our patient conversations. You know, it's, let me bring this back to me and talk about how good we are at this and why you need it. And I'm gonna give you all of the facts. And you can never tie what, you, what the value of what you have to offer to that person's wants or interests if you don't learn what those are. And, and there's a really big discomfort in our industry with the idea of being so vulnerable and asking open-ended questions. And, you know, I, I was at an, uh, an office um, beginning of this year and I had, a, it was a big team, a multi-doctor office. I had an observation day and then I had a, a chat with them. And I had watched several handoffs from hygienist to the doctor, you know, and um, I kind of shared this idea. I'm like, I'm just gonna put a really simple, but, you know, maybe kind of crazy idea out there for you guys. And I said, what if after the doctor recommended treatment, you guys said, some, the hygienist, you guys said something like, you know, how do you feel about that? <laughs> and they were like a, a little taken aback. Um, and one of them actually said to me, well, what if they say it sucks? You know, that's what she said. And I'm like, okay, there's, there's always one in every crowd. Right? <laughs> and I said, so what if they do? I said, what if it, you know what, what if it sucks for them? What if that's how they feel? Can we validate how they feel? Can we assure them that it'll be okay? You know, I, I kind of don't care. They're so, they want to, everybody wants to put a bow on it and have this perfect answer for everything. And, you know, I am a little bit, um, I guess, lucky or gifted in that I, I tend to have the right thing to say. You know, I'm, I'm one of those people who knows the right thing to say. But I, I really tell people all the time that while I do some of this verbiage coaching, what I really think I have to offer is like the right way to think, right? Or the right way to feel about it. And you can be forgiven perfect language all day long if you can demonstrate that you get somebody, you know? And you can't do that if you don't, if you don't come from a place of genuinely being curious about them and genuinely being comfortable that there might be moments of discomfort. But sometimes, you know, I when you tell a person that they have to get a tooth removed and get an implant, that isn't the best news they're getting that day. It might be a little upsetting for them, you know? <laughs> so, and it's, it's probably not going to be a great explanation of, you know, implants that make them feel better. It's, it's, it's not the information that makes them feel okay about proceeding with it. <laughs> you know what I mean? You have to know it. You have to be able to answer those questions should they, should they arise. But I, you know, if we could just break the habit of leading with that, I, I think dentists would be so much less frustrated with the patient. You know, they're they're so frustrated that patients aren't proceeding, and and it's very easy to see when you observe it from the outside why they're not. And it's um, compassion matters. Mm -hmm. You know, and knowing that I've had I've had clients you know, switching it up to dentists now, not even their patients, but dentists now. I have had clients where I've been very honest with them and I've told them, you don't need my services right now. Or, you know, and I would say, hey, what are your concerns? What are your roadblocks? Let's talk about them. And seriously, just refer them elsewhere and yeah. say, you need to fix this first or let, you know, right now, like that issue with the 150, 
you need to help get help from somebody who can help you with the retention part of things right um, before we spend money on any kind of marketing and even that dentist on the phone she's like are you referring me to somebody else <laughs> And I'm like, I'm well, the same. I don't want to, I don't want to help people that I, I, I guess I, I don't want to well, take I mean, the, the thing is, the reality is it's not help. going, it's not yeah. going to change, right? I right. mean, even if you were to do things, it's not going to change. And if it's not going to change, you are not going to be happy, which is not going to make me happy. Right. And now my reputation is going to go down and which we have worked so hard to receive. Right. So, you know, honesty matters, um, making sure that you are answering people's questions matters. And in that same way, I think, you know, this whole topic with treatment acceptance also goes into the recare calls and getting those recare calls, the outgoing calls out there, because how many times have you had those issues? I, I'm telling you, I see it nearly every practice. And I don't mean this as a slight against the services that send out text messages and emails. I think those are fantastic products. There's several of them that I recommend. I love, I love them for the people that they work for. You know, but there's some people that you have to pick up the phone and call. Um, and there's, I have a, a super simple tip I just want to share with you for making outgoing recare calls because I think it helps to think about them different, right? Like if you can just shift up how you're thinking about it. And I, I see teams get really frustrated making those outgoing calls. And um, <laughs> I think it's because they try the same thing over and over again and it doesn't really work for them right? They keep trying and they call 50 people and nobody schedules. But what they're calling and saying is, you know, hi, this is Genevieve calling from Dr. Smith's office and you're overdue for your oral health care examination and prophylaxis. Please give our office a call at your earliest convenience. I, I don't feel very inspired by that. <laughs> I don't see a lot of, um, I, I don't see a lot of great results from that. So, um, something I, I was actually just at call force, by the way, last week. And yeah, I, I they have a really great team. So if your team doesn't have time to do recare calls, that is truly a no paid endorsement on my end, truly a really great service. Um, and you only pay them if they schedule people, which is fantastic. Um, but, you know, I was sharing with them my tips. And one of the things that I find to be really effective when I'm calling people is just to shift up the blame. You know, just in calling and saying you're overdue is a smidge luxury, right? It's a, it's a little bit like, oh, there's another thing you didn't do. And if you're a busy working mom who's got a hundred things that you haven't done yet this week, calling and making the dental appointment and feeling a little bit guilty about it is just gonna go right to the bottom of your list. So when I call to make a recare um, call, I actually call and say, hey, it's Genevieve calling from Dr. Smith's office. It looks like I never got you scheduled for your next cleaning. Can I help you find a time to come in? And I really look at my intention only as calling to help. And I don't view my success based on how many I schedule. I view it like, did I call and have some nice touch points with people? Do they know I care? Do they know I miss them? Can it just be a positive interaction even if they don't schedule with me? Can they just know that I'm here to help and that I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not condemning them for not having gotten their teeth cleaned yet. And I think if you sh sort of shift your expectations of the process and view it as a touch point and an opportunity to help and an opportunity to let people know we're thinking of them and that we miss them, it doesn't feel so high pressure and so ominous to pick up that list and call people, you know? I love it. It's, uh, you know, you are humanizing it. Yeah. And that's funny because we're dealing with humans. <laughs> that's who we take care of. <laughs> <laughs> And I love how you made that about it, about caring um, compared to another to-do list item. Yeah. I mean, and I don't know about you, Manal, but you probably have some things that are undone on your to-do list day over day, right? And oh, so yeah. like we're kind of, I mean, I think most, let's be honest, the person we're trying to reach with a recare call is 90% of the time the female head of household who are typically the busiest humans on the planet with the most undone things on their list. <laughs> <laughs> so, and sometimes they feel the most unappreciated. Let's just call and help them out. Right. And sometimes they feel completely unappreciated and they totally. value that you appreciate them. Yes. Absolutely. You know, uh, when I was talking about marketing and we go through this entire part in my, in my marketing workshops where we create a new patient avatar 
for yes. your specific practice. And I was talking to them about it and I was saying how it's so important. And um, when I do get some of the answers, again, listen, we are not a know-it-all people. You know, we, we same like everybody else, we learn, we experience, we experiment, we push boundaries. You know, we do the whole shebang, right? Like we are, we are learning in this together as well. Um, so, you know, but there are times where I would say, hey, tell me, tell me who you're trying to come to the practice. Who's your ideal new patient, right? And they'll be like, anyone between age 22 and 65. All right, that's great. However, you just gave me three different generations. Right, so any human. So any human, <laughs> and though all of those three different generations have different needs, different yeah. priorities, and different mm -hmm. concerns, and different way they want to be communicated with. You don't want the 65, seven year old, he's not gonna Facebook chat with you to schedule an appointment. Right. But the 22 year old doesn't wanna to talk to you. They do wanna just chat or text with you. Yes. And then you have you know, the Gen X who are the younger families, who are the ones who grew up in the Amazon generation. They want you to make life easier for them. Yes. They want you to be able, I'm like, why don't you give out a plated or one of those bringing home kind of meal service as a giveaway? Why does it always have to be a random cooler? Or here are a bunch of cups. Here are a bunch of cups for you and your family. Here's and seven more tumblers for your tumbler cupboard. My literally, <laughs> my entire cupboard in my kitchen is full of so many tumblers. I and seriously, so many mugs. I have so many of these, and I love them. Like I, I have a serious issue with them, so like I'm legitimately happy to get them, but. I know that there are people who have um, are running out of room for tumblers. Yes, and I'm like, yeah. just you know, I mean, I love listen, the plated idea, right? Like you could do the plated ideas. You could do, and again, knowing your audience, these are young families. They want yes. time. They want ease. You know, the millennials, yes, they want text messaging and they want to just click on something to confirm. They do not want to speak with you. Right. They don't they need want to, to speak avoid with you. human connection. <laughs> and at the same time, right. Right. So we have, and then on the opposite end, we have the boomers who want the human connection. Yes. They're like, you're too lazy if you're texting me and yeah. emailing me, pick up that phone and call me. Yes. Right. Like straight up, give me a call and say, hey, listen, you know, we are X, Y, and Z. Like they want you to do that. So knowing that is so important. And if you were to use those same tips and strategies because you know your audience yeah. to relate to them, to connect to them, and not just add value for the sake of adding dental value, right? but add value to their life, to because their- Because they, they feel like you're people. I, you know, I think they want, a lot of dental patients want to find a place that feels comfortable to them, where they feel like they're with their people. You know, it's just, it's really that easy. It's it's simple, but we, we try to have everything. I When I ask who's your ideal patient, a lot of times what I get, especially for my, uh, my high-end restorative practices who are completely fee-for-service, um, is I think they've, been, they've come to believe that there's a mythical group of patients who don't care about their insurance or don't have insurance, and they have a lot of money and a lot of dental needs, and they specifically value with a higher level skill set of dentistry. And I'm like, I'm going to tell you, as somebody who listens to a lot of phone calls, those are unicorns. They, they exist, but it's very rare that somebody calls and says, hey, I need a full mouth rehab. I don't care what it costs. And I heard you're an expert. You know what I mean? That doesn't, that, there's not a lot of those. <laughs> so we have to find people who can come to understand our value because we can connect with them based on what their needs and and what they want and what's important to them first. Right, and they, and they look at you as a person first. Yes. And then they look at you as your expertise and whatever, I mean, I've, I've had people, I, I recently signed up somebody, Jennifer, this is funny. She met me at DSI. Um, I recently signed up with her. She came to me towards the end of DSI. DSI is this awesome conference in uh, that by Vanessa Emerson. Mm -hmm. It's incredible. She came to me at, at the end of the conference. She said, I have no idea what you do, but I just, I just need you in my life. I just need your help. You, I'm not joking. Like I, just I love your help. And I just need you, yes. need you in my life. And I'm like, and she's like, I have no idea what you do, but I feel that I need you to help me with stuff. And she signed up and she's been doing, she's been a wonderful client and she's again, but she had no idea what I even do. And I mean, so many of the phone calls I get, they don't know what I do. They just heard my name 
or I commented on a Facebook post or they, they saw the show or a podcast, yeah. something, something or the other. And yeah, they are like, they're attracted to you and your style and what right. you Yes. And I've had people who literally call me because they're like, I love shoes too. I love that episode about you talking about your <laughs> shoe experience. Or recently, the, the, the weirdest thing happened. I was speaking in Pennsylvania and I was talking about jewelry and competition and my parents. She's been to my parents' store. She knows. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, everybody loves your parents. <laughs> but it was so funny because she's like, I have been to that store. I know exactly what she's talking about. She's like, oh my God, I know Sam and Mina. This is, and I'm here like in Pennsylvania, in the middle of nowhere, in the study group that I'm speaking at. Right. They know my parents. And you know, that was more of a conversation piece. And they're like, we need to talk to you about all of our needs because they know my parents. Um, and all of that matters because they do, I think that we are changing and this is just me going on a tangent. So I'm, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm with you. I'm with I'm you. Gonna, all right. I'm going to put it out there. So haters, <laughs> you want to hate, go ahead and hate. I don't care. Um, you know, I think what's going on is there is so much of experts around and gurus around and the best, most comfortable dental practices around Yes. with the same photo of the happy family smiling on their websites that people are now saying, okay, well, who are you? Right. You've gone to dental school, so has your competition. You provide yep. this care, so does your competition. You say that, you know, when you're, you have a very happy team, so does your competition. Mm -hmm. Why you? Why yep. should I come to you? Even if you were to take my insurance, somebody else also takes my insurance. Yes. Everybody takes your insurance. <laughs> Everybody takes your insurance, <laughs> right? Much. So, yes. yeah, we work with all insurances. So, uh, you know, going through all of that, it's almost like, why you? Yeah. Why should, you know, just like, why should anybody go and shop at my parents' jewelry store? They have literally 199 of the jewelry stores lined up next to them. Why them? And, and I guarantee you it has nothing to do with the jewelry. <laughs> there's beautiful jewelry up and down that row. But, you know, even their competition can't, can't fight the fact that they're really nice and they take really good care of people. And I think exactly what you said is all the more reason that I get, you know, I have a super broad operational background in dentistry. And yet, you know, I'm sort of known as this new patient whisperer because, and he, here's why, the, the new patient phone call is the first impression of your office. So if you're lucky enough for your marketing to produce an actual phone call to your office, you only get one shot at that impression. That first conversation, should it really be about collecting how to spell your last name exactly? and figuring out is the broken tooth the third from the back or the fourth from the back? Or would it be more beneficial to me to have a, a story about how you broke that tooth on a grilled cheese sandwich? You know? And so sometimes I talk for this exact scenario with teams and I, I've literally heard dental, doctors would die if they heard some of the calls that are happening based on the policies they put in place, you know? And I've, I've, and I've, I've worked, I, was an, I started my career as an assistant, I'm, I'm very, familiar with the process of actually doing the dentistry. Um, and I can tell you that I think it's more powerful to walk into a room and say, a little birdie told me that you broke your tooth eating a grilled cheese sandwich, than it is for me to walk into the room and say, I understand that you've broken your upper left lateral incisor. <laughs> you know, like I, I just don't think, I, I think we focus on the wrong things. And, you know, I have clinicians say, well, I need to know exactly which tooth because I, you know, we have to have the x-ray. This is my favorite. We have to have the x-ray set up. I'm like, if you can't be flexible enough to switch that extra XCP over to take an x-ray on the other side, I, I don't know what to say to you. You're not ready for new patients. Then. <laughs> You've got to be ready to walk in to connect. And yeah, it has to start on the phone and what I hear all over the place, Manal, is the person answering the phone is like the person who knows the most about Dentrix and knows the most about insurance. Right? That's who lands at the front. Oh, oh, she knows everything on the computer. She knows Dentrix really well. She knows, she knows insurance. And I just don't think that those are the most important qualifications for creating the first impression for your dental practice. I actually think it's a disadvantage to know everything about dental insurance. Right. When it comes to new patient conversion. 
Right. And even if, um, you know, and even if you do know so much of it, it goes back to that mindset of recognizing and understanding what your patient is asking for and looking for, I mean, in our day-to-day -day lives, right? Like the places we shop at, why do we shop there? What about them makes us wanting to go there over and over again? And I guarantee you that they have a competition or somebody down the road that has better products, perhaps something better in their service, whatever it is that you're looking for. But why do you keep going back to that place? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, why is, the, why is that, that that you always do that? And it, when you start look, making it about them and not you, it's funny how things change. Yep. It's funny how things change when you start saying, okay, well, what is it that they are looking right. for? What is the concern? Yes. And, well, then, you know, mm -hmm. and frankly, how much better armed you are to, I, what I say is if you can really break the habit of answering their questions immediately with all sorts of assumption behind it and just learn somebody's story with something like, tell me what we need to get you in here for. Tell me about this broken tooth, something open ended and, and you can learn their story. When it comes time to answer their question or potentially overcome an objection, you can give a way more appropriate answer for that person. You can give a better answer to them. You can have something that's meaningful that might overcome an objection. So if they, if they say, you know, I was really hoping to go somewhere and network and you can say, I know you were, but I also know you've had some really bad experiences the last couple of places. And I'd really love to bring you in to see Dr. Smith because he's going to take the time that you need um, with the situation you have. You know, you can tie it back to this thing that you completely understand about them. And I will tell you over and over again, that is the thing that converts those calls. I love Rhonda saying more interested than interesting. I say that all the time. It's a Covey, you know, interested. Um, no, it's not Covey. It's a, uh, oh my gosh, Dale Carnegie. <laughs> uh, be more interested yeah. than interesting, right. Yep. And uh, that he has a quote that says, you'll make more friends in two weeks by being interested than you will in two months by being interesting. And <laughs> scientifically, humans actually care about connection before they care about expertise, Absolutely. right? So, but what we do in dental is we lead with our expertise all the time and we expect people to value it, you know, but it's sort of that head versus heart. And when you, if you don't start with, you know, connecting on how people feel, they just will never come to care about what you know. It just doesn't matter to them until they like you. Absolutely. And, you know, we are getting so many affirmations to all this. We are getting so many comments. Yeah, we are agreeing to some people are feeling us. Alyssa, Rhonda, Trish, <laughs> Deanne, Deanne, Deanne. Oh, she says Deanna, she says, yes, I've known Deanna forever. Oh, she says she loves new patient whisperer. Yeah. I love it. I love that so, Trish says your brother is the rum whisperer. <laughs> yes, Trish. Well, actually, it's me. I made all the all those rum drinks, but you did bring all the rum for us from the Virgin Islands all the way to Kansas City. A little Cruzan. Oh, oh! I had a I had a rum punch party in a hotel room yes. at at one of the last conferences I went to, and it was so packed that we had people in the hallway, <laughs> and I had no idea who came in, who not. It who doesn't a love a rum punch party? And I just gave them a little taste of the St. Thomas rum punch, and um, you know I think it's going to be a tradition now because every I'm going to another conference coming up soon, and the first call, like I was talking to somebody, they're like, "Are you bringing the rum?" <laughs> Well, now you have to. <laughs> I'm like, all right, I got to keep up with this uh, with this reputation now. You know, keep keep going. I know. So we have great. It's not a terrible thing to be known for. I bring my clients cheese curds, huh? Because that's a thing in Wisconsin. <laughs> See, my only thing, that that is my only thing is I most states don't allow you to mail alcohol, so there could right. be. I, I just had to figure out how do I get around that and then life will be beautiful. I don't label it as such. I just won't. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, you know, I just won't. Now, the last thing I know, we, I can't believe you're already coming to that. Topic. I know, I know. We could probably talk all night. We could. We really could. And yeah. everybody who's watching, thank you so much for being here. But last few tips you want to give them. Oh, my gosh. That's a solid question. Um, one of the main tips I really would love for people to consider. If you are working in an office, if you're an office manager, if you're a dentist, uh, many offices have call recording um, already set up as part of their marketing. If you don't, you really should. And if you do have it, you should really listen. I, I think it's really important that you have a sense 
um, oh, Dr. Julie's, Giuliani is on here, that you have a sense of how your phone calls sound. It, it, sometimes I find that doctors are really horrified, really horrified to hear the disconnect between the patient experience they're trying hard to create in the office and the more transactional exchanges that are happening on their phone. Um, so if you're, if you're not, if you don't even have any idea how your phone calls sound, I think it's critical that you take a listen to them. Um, the other thing is that I really think you have to figure out if you if your if your new patients are creating growth in your practice. So um, there's some some ways to look at it. You can shoot me a PM. I can shoot you like a little equation or how I would pull it, um, and I can I can show you how I look at it. Um, but I I think it's just a thing that's off a lot of people's radar. They just don't even have a sense of how new patients are contributing to their practice growth, and they don't have any sense that um, their marketing might not be nearly as effective as it could be. You know, I've had practices that I've worked with double their new patients after just a little bit of call training with no additional marketing spend. Um, and I mean, what that's awesome to do, but it's, it's so critical that before you're making those huge investments that you understand that the people representing you are doing it well. And I totally agree with you, uh, you know, I don't believe in marketing. You know, there's a difference between spending and wasting money. Yes. And you need to understand that difference and say that just throwing something at a marketing outlet, it's not going to fix it. Right. Um, uh, leads are leads. They are not conversions. So there is, you know, and again, this is all, I guess some of you may be like, well, she isn't she, doesn't she do marketing? Yes, I do. I do marketing. I'm a marketing strategist, but that's what strategy comes in. And this is where you have to know your numbers. Right. This is where you have to reach out and like, you know, Genevieve said, listen to those phone calls. Yeah. They will tell you a lot. They will show you a lot. And you know, too, I mean, I, I actually hear phone calls sometimes that are, it's not only are you not converting that lead, you're creating a damaging reputation. The calls are so sometimes rude, sometimes not nice. There are people that now understand that they can't come to you. You know, they're leaving with that feeling like they can't go there for some reason or another. And they're never calling you back. You know, you lost them forever. <laughs> you didn't just lose them for now. Um, and so it's it's really crucially important if you're a practice in growth mode, which is probably likely if you're watching this, um, that you have a sense if that's working for you. And then if it's not, that you take some steps to fix it. And again, simple things. Really simple. Really simple. Really Real simple, you know, real simple things. I think I'm going to tell my team that when they publish this episode on um, on YouTube or if they are, uh, you know, when we have the podcast episode goes live, you're probably going to tell it, say something with, you know, humanizing, how to humanize, how to become humans with your patients. Or yeah. how to <laughs> real talk, right? Just be normal. Yes, yes. You know, real talk. Yes, I do a whole series about that. I do real talk and I share. And again, you won't believe how much I re get received from just, being me Just and being sharing real. my roadblocks and thoughts and, yeah. you know, different things. And I do get people from that. I probably get most engagement. I think my real talks get like hundred or some comments <laughs> because it's just literally <laughs> hashtag real talk with Manal. And it's just me being me. My team it's just doesn't you doing it. you. <laughs> yeah. My team doesn't get to edit it. Nobody gets to see it. It's just me, you know, going through something and just putting it out there. So yeah. absolutely. And Genevieve, if people want to reach out to you, how do they do that? So you can go to my website um, and schedule a call with me if you'd like. It's poppypracticemanagement.com. Um, P-O-P-P-E, right? P-O-P-P-E, yeah. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. I'm pretty sure I'm the only Genevieve Poppy around. <laughs> and you can, um, you know, you can shoot me a PM there. I'm, I'm pretty active socially. I'm also on LinkedIn and Insta and she's awesome. And stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm out and about. I'm easy to find. I make myself easily available. Uh, it's not hard to get right on my calendar to talk to me about it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful episode. And uh, once again, thanks to Corey and Call yes, for us. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Corey, for making it all possible. <laughs> Corey, you're awesome. We love you so much. You. And your product is great. So oh, thank Corey. you so much for, for making it all happen for us. And Genevieve, you are just amazing. You are amazing. This you are amazing. Fun. No, All right. you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks guys for joining in. I know it's hard to have come in on a summer night to hang out with us, but you guys are awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I
I appreciate you. You know, thank you so much. You make doing this on Thursday night so easy. And thank you once again, Genevieve, for being a fantastic guest today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It was truly my pleasure. Thank you. And if you have not watched the episode, no worries. It's going to be on this Facebook wall. It's going to be on YouTube. It's also going to be shared as a podcast and it will be in your email marketing. We got you covered. Thank you so much. <laughs> have a happy weekend. And we'll talk next week. Bye-bye.